And uh, sitting across my desk, my table, is what uh, Mr. David Hockenbrock. And uh, I want to summarize his what the uh, career is what uh, having worked more than 50 years in the corporate world, primarily with three public traded companies. One is Standard Oil Company. The second one is about the Five Stone Tire and Rubber Company, and both companies what the, he worked for, he the, rose to the, the executive level, and then, well, before he retired as CEO and president, he was at the Spartan Corporation for 30 years, and uh, over this period of time of his leadership, Spartan as a public traded company at the NYSE. He grew the company 500% from $60 million of sales to about $300 million of sales. And uh, having 17 planes across the United States, Canada, and Vietnam, and uh, having at the peak about well, 17,000 employees. We are very privileged to have Mr. Hockenbrock here in this studio, in this conference room, and uh, being our first webinar speaker. And uh, I'd like you to join me to welcome Mr. Hockenbrock. Well, it's not a, a big applause. <laughs> it's just because well, we're muted everybody. <laughs> but otherwise, what, uh, I know you are with me and uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Hockenbrock, which I would uh, Call him David, and I think it's uh, very appropriate. And I've known David for the quite some years, ever since I came here to Spring Arbor 20 years ago. And uh, I first came to know David through the church that uh, both he and I attended, and he was a Sunday school teacher. And then I uh, came to know him through our solution seminar, that uh, he was very gracious to speak to our MBA students. It was about uh, 15 years ago. And then subsequently, I asked him to come to my class to speak to the students in the operations management uh, course. And today, well, uh, we can also have, have the privilege of having him come back to this community. And he's doing a number of things. And uh, I got about the piece him about that you retired in 2008. True. But you have not really retired. True. <laughs> you stay yeah. very busy True. the whole time, True. all the time. And, uh, well, without stealing any thunder from David, I'm going to just want to open up with a question. What, uh, David, what, is there anything about yourself that uh, you care to the, tell us, tell the participants? And I'm counting what uh, we have 45 right now who sign on as participants. And um, anything about yourself, uh, from even from the, your childhood to the, um, some of the things that what the, we don't normally ask the CEO to talk about that. <laughs> sure, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, welcome to all. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to share a piece of my own background, which may be helpful to you. And our focus today is to look into the business that you're running and give you some things to think about in making your business not prosperous for today, 2013, but prosperous for 2025 and 2050. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, I am a, a, a product of, uh, of Bill and Betty Hockenbrock. I was their only son, uh, born in 1935, so I'm 78 years old. Uh, so you now know how old I am or am not. And um, uh, I became a Christian at age 15 at the First Church of the Covenant in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I've been a Christian ever since that time. Uh, I do suffer from some of the advantages of being an only child, and again, I'll talk more about that as we get into the text of the background. But um, uh, I want to talk first about how do you get your businesses ready for 2025, because somehow it will get here. Uh, I may not be here, but you'll still be here. And uh, I've, I've captured what I think I understand about 2025 in my own background, and I've come up with 
four things that I think will be present, and they are there will be more change than continuity. There will be more change than continuity. I grew up in a world where certain aspects of business had continuity to them, and you could always plan on them being there. That is going to change, and it's going to change markedly. The other uh, factor is one that we're dealing with today. You see it in the newspaper on a daily basis, and that is terrorism. I don't know how many of you think about the aspects of terrorism on your business, but many years ago when I built a, a plant in Vietnam for Spartan, this would be 12 or 13 years ago, terrorism was a subject that I had to deal with over there. But now we have to deal with it here. More about that later. Then you live in a world of networks. Everybody's part of a network. I grew up in a world with no networks, but over the 50-year the history I had working in public companies, I found myself involved in a world of networks. So we're speaking to you over a network. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what is the sum total of all the networks that interpose with our network today? And then last, but far from least, in thinking about 2025, the business that you will run then, there will be less chance for a financial margin of error. In other words, today you go to business and you have a product. You have gone to the accountants. You have developed a price um, a pricing practice, and you go to market with it. In 2025, my guess is there will be less margin for financial error present then. And here's an off-the-side off the comparison today. Whatever happened to General Motors? I grew up in an era when GM had 55% of the business. They set the price for selling a car. Today, they're gone. What about Yonkers? What about Kohl's? What about J.C. Penney's? What about Sears? Where are they in 2025? My guess is that some of them are not here because there is less of a chance for a financial margin of error. So, as I take my 50 years and I boil it down into something I can talk with relevancy about over the next hour, it's the customer. Every business has customers. And there are a variety of ways of handling or not handling the customer. I'm going to give you one way that I learned over a long, long time, and you're going to find yourself scratching your head and wonder, what is this guy talking to me about? I'm talking to you about your customer, and I'm going to present to you some things that I would ask you to consider doing with your customers so that he will be delighted, not pleased, but delighted with the process. And uh, in looking back at my history at Spartan, I remember well, in 1978, our sales were $65 million. And uh, we had a board of six people, and I can remember like it was yesterday, talking to the board about what are we going to do to grow the business. Well, it didn't happen all at once, but over a period of time, we grew the business to $320 million. And we did that by talking to our customers on an incessant basis and learning so that we knew what they expected from us. And uh, I said to Caleb yesterday when we talked about it, we all see customers as part of a pyramid, like so. And it's divided a third, a third, a third. And the top third of your customers in most businesses account for 80% of your sales. And the rest is distributed in uh, uh, pop column two and column three. But the 80% of your customers that are in category one you better, as a CEO, be in tune with every one of those people. 
so you know the minute they breathe out of pace. So with that, I leave that rest, and uh, Caleb, you probably have a few questions now as we Sure, I do. Uh, thank you, David. And, uh, I want to uh, pick up on the, some of the things that uh, we intend to the, accomplish over this uh, webinar. And by the way, the, now we have 48 uh, participants in the audience. It is great. And, uh, thank you again uh, for joining and those who just uh, uh, sign on. And, uh, I'm uh, Gail Chin in a speaker spot, David Hockenbrock. And um, one thing that uh, we want to accomplish is what the, well, through this leadership webinar is to the look at the principles for the emerging uh, leaders. And uh, well, we can always read books, but there's nothing like uh, turning to someone who has been there, done that if you know what I'm saying. And uh, when I look at uh, David's what the, uh, resume, he kind of shared with me his resume. When he uh, finished his MBA, which was in 1959 at Case Western, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> that tells me how young I am. <laughs> no, not really. I was only the well, I was born in 1960. That gives some perspective. I'm in my 50s, and uh, but here in front of us, what the across the table, what the, is someone who has practiced leadership pretty much what the, for the, his whole life. And uh, I want to the, ask a question about um, leadership. My be traits of leaders. What are you looking for in a leader? And how do you know that what the, you find one in, say, one of your direct reports? Over the years, what you have managed, you've led so many people. How do you know so-and-so has the potential? And what are you doing to help that person become even better? Good, good question. I'll, I'll take it in, in order of importance. Number one, a good leader gets up early in the morning. Why is that important? Because there are certain things you can do early in the morning, like read the Wall Street Journal. I get up at 5.30. I get up at 5.30 all day, every day. Why? Because that's how I was raised. You get up at 5.30. So by the time I would get to work at 7.30, I would have a lot already done in preparation for the day. That's number one. Number two, I look for in a leader someone who can think strategically about the business. If you look at any business, there are matters that you go and you see today and you sort of take care of them and fix them. But if I were to say to you, now this business is going to be here two years, three years from now, what should we be selling then? That calls out a different set of background for anyone. So thinking strategically about tomorrow, next week, next month, next year is a very, very key element. Number three, they have to understand how to care for a customer. Not take care of a customer, how to care for a customer. And I'll give you a couple of things that, that are meaningful to me. If you look at any business today, speed to market is everything. It's not a good to have. Speed to market is everything. So I tell people I work with here at Spring Arbor, and I remember Dr. Webb saying to me back in November when we were thinking about the MedSouth Fund, he said to me, well, Dave, this is going to take three or four years. I said, Chuck, I don't have three or four years. I will give this activity three months of my undevoted time. And I thought he was going to fall out of the chair. And he said, three months? And I said, three months. We will have it done in three months. We had it done in three months because I said to everybody I talked to, here is a deadline you must meet. Not, it would be nice if you met it, this is a deadline you must meet. So today, the MedSouth Fund is up and running. 
and uh, prospering and looking to grow, it's three months old. Why? Because I understood that speed to market is everything. Next, good service is the enemy of delight the customer. How many customers would you go to, just take Sears today, and you go to Sears and you walk up to the next three people and you say, are you delighted about shopping here? Nobody could answer the question because no one is delighted to be shopping there. They're there for another series of reasons, but it's not delight. So when I go back to my Spartan days and I looked at the top third of the people in the pyramid, I wanted to make sure every one of those people would be delighted in doing business with Spartan. And I took that for myself personally. So I met with everybody in the top third at least twice a year, some three or four times, just to be sure that we at Spartan understood what we had to do to delight the customer. Because anything else you do in manufacturing is sort of nice to have, it really would be good to have, but people who decide to stay with you or leave are the customer, no one else just the customer. So you better take good, good care of him or her. Well, David, uh, if I may interject here, then the notion of customers um, are king. <laughs> they are king. Of it. But what do you do when you have difficult customers? And, um, well, can you afford the spending or the resources to take care of every single one, or do you have to be more selective? Kind of takes back to the, um, well, I did not do a good job in uh, introducing uh, the company that uh, you uh, retired from as CEO and president. Uh, but Spartan, to my knowledge, is a diversified manufacturing company that, have, uh, that has what the clients in the government sector, in government defense, electronic contract manufacturing, medical device, automotive, all in the gas industries, and uh, among all these customers, well, uh, are there any customers that you would say, oh, I would love to keep these customers, but not the others? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good question. Let me tell you the process that I established, not in year one or two, but I think in year three. Mm -hmm. uh, in year three, we would have a staff meeting, much like in this conference room, and we would sit down and we would look at every customer we had in the top two tiers. And we would go through and we would rate them. Uh, how are we doing? Are we doing well or not so well? And we would typically find two or three every year that we would get rid of. Uh, and, and most of them were in the automotive game. In fact, uh, one of the things I did in probably year 22 or 23, was to sell all of our automotive businesses because I recognized that while Spartan had a history in the automotive industry, it goes way back to the, uh, the time when the horn was invented. They were not people that we could get along with today, and uh, we could not do anything that would make them delighted. Uh, they were always after us for a lower price, and there was never any bottom. So I sold it, got out of it, and went away. And with that, I probably solved back then two-thirds of my customer retention problems by getting rid of the automotive business. What do you mean by that? Um, by that? Hmm. What do I mean by that? I thought you, you, said about that, uh, you said that they were like recurring problems. They, they, there were recurring problems that you could never fix. For example, if I said to you, well, you know, the price for this is $1.35, and you said, well, it needs to be $1.13. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no relevance for $1.13. I can't make any money. You can't make any money. So that's an unreasonable request. You're gone. Yeah. You're gone. So there was an intentional strategic decision. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Who was it, 
Who the key? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You can't please everybody. You cannot please everybody. Yeah. You cannot do that. All the time. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, your employees? Yes, uh, I have read that the uh, um, at GE, well, uh, they uh, they get rid of the ten percent of the bottom employees um, every year because what the Jack uh, believes that what the this ten percent what the that don't belong to GE. Can you comment on that? Uh, I I could. Uh, I don't know. Uh, where he's coming from, mm -hmm. uh, I would look at the customer base that you have versus the employees. And uh, to say that 10% of my employees are bad people, so I want to fire them all, that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have picked the right people to start with, and you are union free, which I was not union free at the start of my career at Spartan, but when I retired in 2008, we were union free. And uh, I could spend time with each and every employee knowing that they were good people because we participated in giving them a share of the profits in the plant in which they worked. So they had a part in every key decision because the profitability or lack of profitability of that plant impacted the income that they took home. So that would be my answer to how do you get good employees, how do you keep good employees, you make them part of the management process. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, a, that's wonderful. Um, well, as we the, were the, uh, visiting yesterday, and we also talked about the how to motivate your employees. So that what the, it's not just what the, you or the, the top executives who will be uh, serving your top customers. But from the CEO down to the janitor, if you will, they are serving the customers. And so how do you make that happen yeah. without uh, imposing on someone? Okay, well, your paycheck is going to be the, depending on what, how, how motivated motivated you are, or no, it's not the paycheck uh, that they're going after, it's something else. Yeah, yeah let, let me speak to that point. Let, let me take you into a day in, in my life, uh, probably in uh, the middle 1990s. Uh -huh. uh, in our Jackson plant, we would invite uh, three or four people from the United States Navy, our biggest customer in the Jackson plant. Uh, we had 226 people there building uh, Sonoboy components for the U.S. Navy. So the, the Navy would send three or four of its people and they would spend two days in the plant, not with me, not with the leadership of the plant, but with everybody in the plant. So here is Susie who's putting two parts of a Sonoboy together and she sees a Navy colonel that's her customer's customer, and he's talking to her about her job. That makes her very, very important. It also puts um, her in a position to participate in the profits of the plant because she is contributing to the profits in the plant. So my, my way of handling that was always, always to take the customer relationship down to the lowest possible level and get everyone involved. When you do that, something very strange happens and you don't always see it. Your customer becomes so intent with the business and the process that you're doing for him, it's incredible. For example, I would say, Mary would say to the customer, well, here's my, today it would be, here's my cell phone number. Call me if you have any problems. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't call me. He'd call her. That's what you want. That's how, how I would call, that's customer ownership of the business process in our plan. If you could do that all the time, every time, in every one of your plants, you would own the world. 
you would own the world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we are receiving some questions from the, the participants, and um, maybe we can just start uh, uh, answering some of them. Sure. And then we can fine. go back to some of the fundamentals. Right. And uh, my question came up is what the, how do you manage change, which is a constant. Yeah, how do you manage change? Well, change comes all day, every day. First, first of all, you have to go through a sorting out process. If you're a CEO of a business, significant changes, not all change, but, but significant changes wind up on your plate. So you have to look at them and decide what's key, what can I make go away, what doesn't impact me. So let's assume that you have three key decisions. Uh, in a manufacturing business, they usually involve down to the tooling level, and you, and you have to think about that and think about the change on the economic structure of the pricing of the product. So I would tend to answer every uh, request for change on its effect on the pricing. And I would spin around back to the customer and say, you know, I can do this change for you, but it's going to increase your cost by 55 cents. And then I've really turned the question back to him, so he gets to decide. I don't have to decide. I just tell him what the components are. OK. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Another question is on the, what process what the, did you use to select the right employees for key positions? And um, well, um, Jim, uh, Jim Collins what the, talked about the putting the right people on the bus. Putting so the right people on the, the bus. There yeah. are some yeah. criteria. Yeah, and sure. process, too. I think what the focus yeah. is the more on process. Right. Uh, the selection of key employees at Spartan was done by the human resources people. Uh, I rarely uh, did an interview. And I would do an interview only if the person was going to report to me. Other than that, it was what I would call a casual interview. I would interview, but I would never make the, the hire or don't hire decision. That would be up to the staff member that uh, he or she was going to work for. I found that that was a good tactic to do over a long period of time, keep it at the lowest level, mm -hmm. let, let whoever the boss was going to be decide. But I would say to the boss, number one, the person has to be honest beyond repro reproach. If there's any question about honesty, they cannot work at Spartan, period, end of conversation. They can't work here. because. No business can afford to let any avenue of unethics creep into the company. Once it gets in, it grows. Other than that, that's how I handled it. Hmm. In your 30 years working time with uh, leading Spartan, uh, David, but, uh, were there any times that uh, you uh, feel like, wow, well, if I don't do this, I might lose my top customer? I'm talking about integrity when your customer is being uh, unreasonable and uh, wanting you to do this or that because of the volume of business that they sent you, you feel like, well, we have to compromise. Or it might be what the, everybody knows you from day one, that you're not going to compromise as such, well, they won't even bother. Yeah, that happened a few times, not many, but a few times, and uh, I would leave that at the at the lowest possible level to mm -hmm. handle. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I had to get in an airplane and go somewhere and see the customer face to face, I would do that. So it, if it came to a larger customer where somebody has to decide or not decide, that would be me. And I would get in the plane and I would do that face to face with a customer. And, and I would boil our issues down to three or four, something very simple that we could talk about in probably 35 minutes or, or less. And we would come to an agreement on those or not. And then if, if I had to kiss him goodbye, I would shake his hand and say, it's been nice knowing you, but uh, have a nice life, but not with me. Mm -hmm. Well, let's also look at the, the bright side of uh, having a wonderful relationship with your customer. And, um, you that share with me then that you have 20 customers who represent 80% of your business. Right. And uh, you do something very special. With right. them, like uh, writing a personal note to them and uh, sending the gifts to them on the birthdays and whatnot. Um, I, I did that on a regular basis because all of us are people. Yeah. 
and what do we appreciate most? The small things in life that don't cost anything. Mm -hmm. So I developed a habit, and I did it for many, many years in the top customers of the company. I knew their wives, their children, and their grandchildren, and I would send gifts to them, not a big gift, but a birthday gift usually, and write letters to them. That was so astounding because no one did that. Uh -huh. No one did that. And that built a bond between me and the customer that was almost impervious over time. And the, the, and the return? <laughs> the return was we got their business, we continued to get their business, because they trusted me mm -hmm. at a very new level. Yeah. And it becomes very personal. Oh, very personal. Relationship. Very personal. And uh, didn't you say that they even invite you to the, say, maybe their daughter's wedding or whatnot? Mm -hmm. I, that happened on several occasions. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back for the 50 years, and uh, what are some of the things that, that you are very proud of that you have done and you have left a legacy? Um, well, let, let's not take them in order because my mm -hmm. brain doesn't work that way. Um, I, I think uh, building a new plant was one of the most exciting things I ever did because you would go into an area and uh, we would build a plant that would typically house two to three hundred people. And uh, you'd get involved with people in the community, and uh, the plant would go up, and then you'd begin hiring and training people. There is nothing more thrilling to me as a manufacturer than building a new plant, hiring people, and see it make an economic impact in the area. That, that, that's what I would say is my greatest thrill. Mm -hmm. Was there one day that you uh, went to work after your daily uh, routine? devotions, that, that you just didn't feel things were going the right direction. And you stop and you ask, God, well, what should I do? Or yeah. maybe it's not a, a practice at all. Mm -hmm. uh, when I had those quiet times uh, impact me during the work day, uh, not all the time, but typically I would go out and get in my car and I'd ride around for 20 or 30 miles just to be free of phones and, and other interruptions, just to have quiet time and to think about what I should do because at the end of the day, the decision's mine. That's right. And, uh, and I would think about what, what do I do. Uh, that was a time for me to pray, to ask God's wisdom in leading me. And I can truthfully say that in no case was he ever the author of something that was evil or out of his word. Speaking of God uh, in the workplace, uh, when I was uh, in one of the Sunday school sessions about the probably 20 years ago, and uh, you held up a Bible in one hand, and then the, you told your class this, I'm paraphrasing, there is not one problem in the workplace that you cannot find an answer from this book, the Bible. That Tell is, us more about it. That, that's as true today as it was back then. Uh, the Bible is like no other book I've ever read. Um, it's God's own testament on mankind mm. forever. And uh, in, his, in his own way, once you think through how, how God put the Bible together, he has dealt with every single problem that mankind or womankind has today. And he's dealt with it in his word, not in one instance, but in several instances. So if you become an erstwhile reader of the Bible, you will become uh, sufficient for work in modern day to beyond anything I could tell you about. Hmm. Well, David, about that, did, uh, more questions uh, from the, the participants, and uh, quite a few of them they, uh, were uh, follow-up questions on what you just shared with us. I'm going to go through them, maybe one by one, and then uh, we'll see the 
how many of them we can go through. One is what the, on terrorism. Uh, what can businesses do to mitigate the effects of terrorism on the operations in the future? Come up the, with the notion that the, well, we are also the living in a globalized uh, we, we are. economy, and the terrorism seems to be a reality more so than an exception. It, it does. Let me answer the question mm -hmm. by giving you several other questions. Yes, please. Number one. The fact that terrorism is on my list is an unusual circumstance. It's on the list because I believe it's real. So if you have a plant in Vietnam where we have a lot of experience at Spartan, terrorism is over there much more so than it is here in the United States or Canada. Terrorism is on the mind of people over there. So they will come to you and ask, what is your policy on bringing weapons into the plant? Well, we don't have that policy in the United States or Canada, but over there you better have a policy and you better have an infrastructure set up to enforce the policy. So that's terrorism at the base level over there. My point in adding it to the list is it's something that modern day Americans and Canadians who build plants around the world need to think about because it's here and it's live and real. Look on the news last night about the uh, uh, incidents in uh, Nairobi. Mm -hmm. At a shopping mall, 68 people dead. Are you kidding me? Mm. Well, one other question that has to do with communication. Well, the every leader is a good, effective communicator. Uh, how do you foster communication throughout the organization? And this particular participant also shared about that one of uh, his biggest problems is getting everybody on the same page. Here's my answer for that. Yeah. Everybody in Spartan, when I was there, everybody had to write a one-page report at the end of each month and submit it up the line, and it eventually wound up on my desk. So I had the report of every single worker, workplace supervisor in Spartan, one page. Hmm. Now, that does a couple of things. Number one, it forces everybody to think through what they're going to say to me and to their bosses. Number two, it forces them to write it, and they write it on a continuous basis. That has untold effects on the organization in total. So putting everybody on the same page, and uh, it's like what the Jim Collins again was that when you have the right people on the bus, and the bus is going the same direction that everybody understands it. Not one wants to go east, and the other wants to go to west. So your the your advice is very valid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to the, know what exactly they're doing, and be able to the share that brief. And uh, it's not like you have five pages. But well, well, every down to one page. Great. There's a question about the silo management. You know silos. Yes, I do compared to the, maybe the uh, matrix organization. Uh, comment on that. Do you believe in it or the, does it not work in the manufacturing, especially in Spartan? Uh, I've lived in both. Mm -hmm. Silo management is dead. Mm -hmm. It ought to be given a burial mm -hmm. and we never see it again. Okay. Uh, today it's all matrix managed uh -huh. and should be that forever. Mm -hmm. Silo management just to go back to something we all know and can recognize, in my mind, is what killed General Motors. Mm. And you have seen the enough of General Motors uh, over the years. And, uh, well, it used to have 50% or more. 55%. 55%. Right, 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 right. And l let me just follow up on that and give you something else I think we should all think about. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, 
if you look at that and you couple that to market speed, silo management will always precipitate a low speed organization. Matrix management permits a high speed organization. You got to think about that for a while, but that is true. I've lived through it and I've seen it. I've seen it. The other thing that matrix management does versus silo management, matrix management enables you to get better people, you pay them more money, and they are fewer. Mm. Let's move on. A uh, couple more questions. And, uh, I'm also looking at our clock, and uh, we have about 10 to 11 minutes. And uh, I hope that everybody's enjoying this uh, webinar. And, uh, I have enjoyed it uh, tremendously. And, uh, I have the privilege of uh, uh, just sitting across the table from the, our speaker. And I hope you are able to the, listen in all right and uh, check with a couple people on the, the audio and also video and that seems to be the going okay and a uh, couple more questions one is um, has something to do with the biggest challenges uh, at Spartan while you were CEO uh, were they the employee problems were they the customer problems were they the quality issues or what not those and were, how do you overcome them too? Yeah, those were all minor problems that Joe would be in a CEO. You're going to have them all the time. Mm -hmm. But the, the real things that get your attention are what I would call market-driven problems. Something that happens in the market you didn't see coming. And it's going to impact you in a very real way and it's going to impact you very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can think of three times when that happened. Uh, I think uh, in looking back we, we dealt with them successfully because we had a new product ready to introduce to make the old one go away. And the new product carried with it a different, a different level of economic coming into the marketplace. And so our, my own, my own uh, avenue was to introduce a new product in an old product marketplace that had been dominated for a long time by an older product. Mm -hmm. Let, let me speak uh, while we're sort of on that person and take a tangent, sir. Mm -hmm. I think um, you and everybody in the audience understands today the frustration we have of calling, I'll pick AT&T, you call AT&T and you're on there for 20 minutes and you're not talking to a real person. You're talking to a voice recorder. Press here, go mm -hmm. here, go there. And finally, in frustration, if you're like me, you just hang up because how can you talk and get something resolved unless you talk to a real person? So I would say in thinking ahead to 2025, if I were advising any of your clients, I would say go back and think through what your customer relationship is and should be and then make sure that any customer calls talks to a real person, that will immeasurably set you apart from your competition today, talking to a real person. Mm -hmm. I know one insurance agent in, in our area here who has two people staffed and they handle all incoming calls. It's a delight to do business there. So I wanted to get that in so mm -hmm. as uh, we didn't forget to do that I later. I've got a couple of uh, participants uh, raising the question for them regarding startups. And, um, well, some of our the students, alums, but, um, they have worked in the college world. And they may not uh, see the possibility of rising to the top like you did. What about startups? Would you advise them to the go after startups versus what the trying to push themselves up to the top rank? My, my advice today mm -hmm. would be I would not work anywhere mm -hmm. unless I had the opportunity to participate in the success of the business. In a public company, which I worked my entire career in public companies, uh, I never had an assignment where I didn't have a stock option. 
because I made that a point of hiring. Someone would come to me and say, would you like to work here? I say, sure. What about stock up? Even if it was five or ten shares, at least I had an opportunity to participate in the wealth of the company. If I didn't, I wouldn't work there. Hmm. A different question has to do with the sell to the government. Uh, one of the participants was the, uh, is the president of a the manufacturing company uh, in Jackson. And the question is, what, um, if you're not selling to the government right now, um, would you uh, pursue direct sales, given that the government is also the cutting the budget? Yeah, I would. Uh, the, the government it will always be a good customer, no matter how small or large they are. They will always be a good customer because once you get in, and that's a difficult assignment to get in, once you get in, you're always in, and they always pay their bills, not always on time, but they always pay their bills. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to, to pursue. So I would say I would pursue government sales. If you don't have anyone in your company who really understands that, you need to go hire a consultant, usually based in Washington, D.C., who can represent you. If you want some good names, write me. I'll, I'll turn you over names that I know of. One of them will not be me but I will, uh, I will turn over the name to you, and uh, um, we'll see how that goes. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, uh, at least on my computer, I'm seeing that uh, uh, most all of the questions have been uh, addressed, and uh, we're winding down in the last couple of three minutes. And, uh, is there one parting advice that you'll give all of us and um, again, in the audience, we have uh, MBA students who are in the program. We have alumni who have been out five, seven, ten years, and the, uh, the MBA program has been around for the 20 years. So we do have someone uh, who uh, has been out there more than 15 years, 18 years. We also have some of the younger students in the audience for that. If you were to give a parting advice, for this audience, what would that be if their goal is to be a leader? Think ahead to 2025 hmm. and think strategically with regard to any business you're in, what does this business look like in 2025 and do I want to be a part of that? And if the answer is yes, then you've renewed your, your uh, uh, opportunity to stay where you are. If your answer is no, you better look for another job. Hmm. Wow, that's very good advice, um, David. And on behalf of um, our audience and also the, the Institute of Business faculty, I want to uh, thank you Welcome. for your the time and uh, your love uh, of helping younger people succeed. And uh, I want also to, to the, thank the audience for the participating and the, the many questions that you have uh, shared with us and uh, I hope we have uh, answered them uh, sufficiently. And uh, let me also make a uh, commercial right here. Our next speaker is going to be the Mr. Anil Singh Malaris. He's a former executive of Microsoft and he's going to be with us in the, I believe, two weeks, I might be mistaken, that is October 10th. We'll send out invites like we do today, and um, uh, mark the date is October 10th, same time, uh, over lunch, and we hope it has worked out all right. And uh, as I uh, was thinking about the, what would be a good time for the lunch time, probably is the best if we were to include more people, uh, but if, say, down the road, we discover that there are better times than the over lunch, and we might be able to reach more uh, of our the current students, former students, and uh, there are also the, some of the faculty that, who are part of this conversation, too. So, the, again, I wanted to uh, thank you, and I wanted to encourage you to come back. <laughs>